This video is dedicated to my child, who either was born already or will be born the month this video comes out. Welcome to the world. I'm looking forward to meeting you. And I'm so, so sorry. Well, it's 2022. Time to check the news and see what baby brain has me missing out on. After the last two years, this year's got a lot of insane, horrible shit to live up to. Sweden seems to be overrun by the living dead, what's called the Draugr invasion of 2022. It's caused by the dreaded Omega variant that has created zombie-like conditions. Pfizer and Moderna say their vaccine should be effective against the Zorona virus. That line is awful. Who wrote this crap? Oh, God. I gotta check on Mia. Okay, phone, call Sweden. Uh, Mulder residence. Hey, Mia, the news is saying that there's zombies? Oh, yeah, that. Um, I mean, it's, it's really nothing. An over-exaggeration if I ever heard one. Well, at least there's a vaccine. Were you able to get it? What? No, I have no idea what's in those things. Scientists develop the vaccine. The people who invented climate change? I'll take my chances with the Zorona virus before getting one of those. Listen, I'd like to chat, but, uh... Let's, let's wait till you bring the Monday discourse back. Uh, I'm, I'm a little busy right now. Oh god. Well, Mia Mulder from MiaMulder.com knows what she's doing. She's a grown woman. So back to the news. Alarm bells ring in Virginia today as nuclear fallout from the bombing of Washington, D.C. blows into the state. Wait, how'd I miss that one? FEMA has sent every resident nuclear fallout suits to wear outside to protect themselves from the radiation as well as to not contaminate those around them. Oh god. My podcast co-host Scott lives in Virginia. I better go check up on him. Hey, hey, Scott. I heard that you're being bathed in nuclear fallout right now. How you holding up? Oh, hey. Uh, you know, not too bad. Uh, you know, the nuke thing was a bit of a... It's a bit of a bummer, but I think we're all back to normal now. How's the fallout suit? Uh, no, I, I don't, I, I don't wear those. I mean, look, the way that I see it, I'm in my 20s, you know, barely. I eat my vegetables. I eat keto cereal for crying out loud. I'm gonna be fine. You know, what's a little radiation gonna do? Actually, qu quite a lot. Plus, you could then contaminate others. See, there you go again with your Canadian sensibilities. Look, safety is all fine and good, but you gotta draw the limit somewhere. I, for one, choose to sacrifice a little bit of security if it means I have my freedom. I mean, it's just a suit. Freedom, Tristan. Just freedom. Oh God, that's wild. Um. I guess 2022 is living up to the rest of the decade so far. Toronto is reeling from the threat of Biclops, the 300-foot-tall, two-eyed Cyclops. The government sent out an evacuation order for the whole city. The problem is some people are holding out in defiance of government orders. We asked local business owner Mildred Thinkenslime about why he defied the order and is keeping his gym open. People keep trying to position me as an anti-evacuator. I'm not against evacuations. I think evacuations are safe and effective. It's just that I don't think the government should be in the business of telling people what to do. I'm an adult. I can think for myself. If Biclops, the terror of the Great Lakes, comes stomping through the area, I know exactly what to do. Real quick, before he steps on me, I just throw on the helmet and I'm fine. I've read at least one study that suggested if you get stepped on by Biclops while you're wearing a helmet, then you're probably fine. I don't, exa I don't remember where I read it. Besides, I'll be goddamned if I'm gonna be thrown out of my house by a monster that doesn't even have depth perception. Though the Biclops does have two eyes. What? I guess, I guess cause, cause a, cyclo cause a Cyclops has one eye, they don't call that uniclops. So I would, I would, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you to check your, your facts on that one. I have, well, I haven't read all the latest data on that, so I can't speak to that in particular, but I, I think, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do whatever's the easiest for me, and that's probably the safest thing to do. Okay, what the hell's going on? 
these are basic safety measures that anybody should be able to take. Why are so many people not doing essential, simple things that can save lives? But first, as a responsible parent, I will need to protect my home from the perils of zombies, nuclear fallout, kaijus, and regionally locked content. So, I want to talk about today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is a simple, solid, safe solution for your security needs. It has a simple one-click or even zero-click connection for lazy people like me. You click to connect to over 5,400 servers in 59 countries. With those, you can be safe and fast. In fact, it's the fastest VPN in the industry. You can also use faraway servers to get around region blocking or to put the end to price discrimination. And like Skyrim, NordVPN's available on nearly every device you got. Windows, gotcha. Android, of course. Apple, sure. Even Linux for you real OGs. The only thing they're missing is the smart fridge, which Skyrim still has the advantage on them on. And your home is safe. Safe in the fact that NordVPN has diskless servers and even an option to double VPNs to keep people off your trail. So if you want to check it out, go to nordvpn.com slash stepbackhistory or use the code stepbackhistory at checkout to get a nice discount on me. Hey everybody, it's a voiceover of Tristan from the actual present in January 2022. I just wanted to add a little bit here that um, there's a special offer going on for NordVPN. So if you go to nordvpn.com slash setbackhistory, you get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk-free uh, because NordVPN has a 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, now back to the content. So let's look first at our Zorona virus and the vaccines. Many of us were a mix of shocked and yet not surprised to see the backlash against COVID vaccines. There are quite a lot of ways to bite into this apple. COVID was, in many ways, a confluence of many factors. A perfect storm of misinformation and bullshit. So, let's get shoveling. First, there's a strong current of anti-intellectualism circling the world right now. Finding an origin to this is a lot to unwrap, though. Mistrust or hostility to educated people has been around for a long time. Anti-intellectualism often comes in the guise of speaking for the common folk. Usually, anti-intellectuals portray academics as a form of elite to deride. And to some extent, I get it. Rich people suck. Blaming university degrees for the existence of rich people would make me pretty mad too. The Academy has a reputation for being a place for those of wealth and privilege. And again, though this has lessened in recent years in some areas, this is a legitimate grievance. It's a problem with a lack of access to education. Charging tuition for schools is a crime against humanity. But reactionary thinking tends not to look too hard for causes, just pure grievance. In some places, like the United States, it's created an almost disdain for education. Being successful without schooling is a sort of perverse point of pride. Totalitarian regimes also have wielded anti-intellectualism across the political spectrum. It's often an effort to suppress dissent to their authority. Psst. This is why the US does it, but that's a topic for another video I'm gonna make someday. During the reign of fascist dictator Francisco Franco, nearly 200,000 people died. All were killed to cement his regime, a good chunk of them being the Spanish intelligentsia. The Khmer Rouge sought to eradicate the educated people of Cambodia for a similar reason. They wanted to suppress political dissent and saw the educated as the source of that. Back to vaccines. The anti-vaccine movement has also been a developing threat for years before the COVID pandemic. This crisis gave them a huge opportunity to expand their influence. They'd be able to manipulate people way outside of mommies and daddies who want to kill their kids with whooping cough. The movement's gone through phases of finding various safety concerns about vaccinations. Then, once discredited, they move on to another invented problem. We've seen concerns about thimerosal and vaccine schedules, but for modern COVID stuff, we've seen uh, th microchips, 
We've seen uh, Jeffrey Epstein's DNA as kind of more COVID specific boogeymen. This is the age old situation though of a conclusion looking for a reason. This isn't by any stretch new either. There were anti-vaccine people back when we started inoculating people against smallpox. Here's an 1802 political conic about them. Now, sometimes vaccine programs have been sources of bad shit. I remember the CIA faked a vaccination program in Pakistan in order to spy on Osama bin Laden's compound, for one. The medical industry has a history of malfeasance against people of color as well. They've been victims of experimentation on drugs and involuntary sterilization. In the case of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, they withheld treatment from black people with a fatal illness. Why? To see what happens. I mean, how much of modern medical science is built on HeLa cells? These are cancer cells cultured by a black woman named Henrietta Lacks without her permission. Scientists profited from them without her family's consent or even knowledge for decades. The more modern anti-vaccine movement has a long and twisting history. The movement's central dogma is a false connection between vaccines and autism. Of course, it's a connection long since discredited, but it has a massive follower base ready to kill their kids en masse for this belief. Yet nothing that I could say would come close to the H Bomber Guy video on the anti-vaccine movement. So I'll just point you there instead. The origin of this hesitancy is complex, but the most common culprits are the alternative medicine industry. They're just trying to grow their margins. Also present is the reactionary anger against what they see as the demystifying of the world. The latter seeks to unexplain the world as it is. They favor a more supernatural, often religious, literalist view of the world. I know I'm assigning a lot of homework here, but there's a really good video on this subject by Folding Ideas called In Search of a Flat Earth, and I cover it in pretty good detail. It's honestly one of the best YouTube videos on the website, actually. The second source of vaccine hesitancy is much more treaded ground at this point. It's a potent combination of mistrust in the media and online misinformation. Media distrust is not necessarily an unhealthy thing, though. I, myself, watched profit-driven media figures talk us into pointless wars. It showed a, a deep rot at the center of journalism. The need to keep advertisers and maintain access to powerful sources led to many of the most significant news institutions becoming more or less stenographers for governments and corporations. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. It's also easy to make content today without gatekeepers for audiences of millions. I mean, look at me. I'm just some PhD dropout in Canada with a, a camera who's gotten millions of views on my crap. It's fantastic, which stories like this don't acknowledge. New voices have become prominent. They're changing our conversations, perspectives, and cultural ideas. But being able to post anything means being able to post anything. So misinformation proliferates, and the source's credibility means less and less. Sometimes, like with Facebook and many bad news sites, this is done for money. Bad information is attention grabbing and attention is an invaluable resource. Governments have also gotten into using online misinformation for their geopolitical goals. Sowing chaos or elevating particular perspectives has a lot of benefits in the turf war between rival criminal gangs that we call countries. So this problem will likely haunt scientific developments and cultural milieu forever. That is, unless something about our communication media and economic system drastically changes. Mainly because there's one more major reason people haven't gotten vaccinated. 
It's one that many neoliberal states don't want to bring up. Divestment from public transit and erosion of workers' rights has created people who can't afford to take time off to go get the shot, even if they do make the trek across the decaying public transit. They literally cannot take time off to deal with potential side effects. Changing that would involve the government spending money on things that aren't the police and military, and that's not popular with donors. Plus, serious side effects might need a trip to the doctor in the US. That's a pricey activity not everyone can afford. But it's much easier to point to the anti-vaccine movement and blame the state's inability to do even basic things for non-wealthy people on them. Okay, but masks, though? Like the fallout suit, the mask is a simple thing to put on to protect yourself and others. What problem could people have with that? Why are we seeing epic meltdowns over what amounts to a simple common courtesy? Something that not only benefits yourself, but makes the community safe. Well, that last bit there outlines the problem. A minority of people tried to claim masks were dangerous or ineffective. But like with the vaccines, they show many signs of working backwards from a decision that they want to make anyway. The arguments about masks suffer from media mistrust and misinformation that more or less defines our era. The main reason people seem angry over something so benign and basic isn't so much the masks themselves, but in just being told to do anything. A lot of hostility seems to come from governments mandating things like masks, even if it's an essential, understandable public health measure. These people wouldn't blink about the government running an evacuation order during a hurricane, for example, but putting on a mask during a virulent plague? That's too far, uh, especially because mask wearing helps other people and anti-mask people seem to have a strong anti-collectivism mentality. Essentially, doing something as part of a group, especially to benefit people who aren't you, is evil for some reason. Who knows, maybe we found out that adult oppositional defiant disorder is a thing. There's also a political angle to this. Opposition to masking and mask mandates mostly comes from the political right. Studies of those with conservative politics show a strong desire to see suffering in those they dislike. The urge to quote, own the libs, if you will. So if the libs are saying thing A, these people will revel in being against it, no matter what. It's a fun combo of childish and sadistic. But the masking issue is actually one where there's much more smoke than fire. Important to note is that while anti-mask folks did cause an uproar, mask use overall was pretty good. Uh, as more anti-maskers received their Herman Cain awards, masking became a more common practice. Now, if only we could adopt that for the age of the variants. It's essential though to acknowledge the impression a loud minority can make. And we know how defiant personalities, smoke over flame, and even misinformation affect these kinds of public health efforts. Because we've seen all of this before. It was over government mandates for something few people would object to today. Buckle up for safety, buckle up. Buckle up for safety, always buckle up. Yeah, the seatbelt, our kaiju evacuation order. Today, over 90% of people use them, and for a good reason. They're a simple, safe way to protect yourself in the case of a car crash. Buckling up is second nature, and it's not seen as some fundamental violation of your freedoms. But that wasn't always the case. Cars began without seatbelts at all, and traffic accidents were causing a lot of death. It's actually kind of wild how cars in general added so much more death to the world and we kind of just rolled with it. When we started mandating seatbelts in the early 70s, the effort received the wildest resistance. 
People compared legislators to Hitler. They received death threats. Part of the reason was that, like masks and vaccines, they were a little uncomfortable. Yeah, that, that's really it. Uh, the American motto should definitely be give me convenience or give me death. But most people hated seatbelt mandates on ideological grounds. 86% of people surveyed believed that seatbelts save lives, but fewer than half actually wore them. Only 35% of people supported seatbelt mandates. One man voiced his opposition this way. This is not supposed to be Russia, where the government tells you what to do and when to do it. Seatbelt legislation stalled and stopped many times in the 70s. They faced significant backlashes every time. Ronald Reagan tried to loosen safety standards, but the Supreme Court blocked him. Seeing seatbelts as a political hot potato, efforts shift towards airbags instead. Unfortunately, airbags are a much more expensive technology for car companies. In the end, the cheapness of car manufacturers is what won the seatbelt mandate. Reagan's transportation secretary, Elizabeth Dole, tried to get airbags in cars by telling the manufacturers they needed to get two thirds of states to pass seatbelt mandates or they'd need to install airbags. Despite lobbying efforts, they couldn't get all states to pass them by their deadline of April of 1989. They still managed to get a lot of states on board though. In the end, they had to install airbags and the US adopted seatbelt mandates. Today, only New Hampshire doesn't have seatbelt laws and almost everyone there wears one anyway. However, what's important to note is that they too had misinformation about seatbelts. People claimed they were more dangerous than not wearing them. Anti-seatbelt people got mad, made threats, and complained as mandates went into place anyway. Adoption kept increasing. And today, the idea of being an anti-seatbelt crusader seems silly outside of maybe the Libertarian Party. I'm a white male, age 18 to 49. Everyone listens to me, no matter how dumb my suggestions are. We can thank the obvious benefits borne out in road fatalities, but we can also thank consciousness raising through ad campaigns and exposés on the necessity of seatbelts, like for example, Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed. But we don't have the luxury of time. COVID continues to mutate, and as of December of 2021, the pandemic doesn't seem to have an end in sight. In fact, we just got announcements today about how Ontario is basically going to have every single citizen get the new Omicron variant before the winter is over. What I'm trying to say is that we don't have time for ad campaigns to stop the spread of this virus. Do we try something different? Do we reach out to our loved ones who have gone down a Facebook hole into utter insanity? Do we just give people facts and just hope that they come to conclusions on their own, unprodded? Sure, those are good options, but it seems that the only thing that can win them over is time and consequences. But unfortunately, that's a lousy answer because unlike seatbelts, when you fail to do these basic health measures, you get others killed. It might be anticlimactic, but please let us know if you have an answer to this. We're kind of struggling here. The only advice I can give is to be a good example yourself. Get vaccinated, wear a mask, social distance and such. If someone is hesitant and not working backwards from a conclusion, educate them. Oh yes, and enjoy the sweet curative relief of horse pain. Hey, I haven't plugged my Patreon in a while. I'm currently on parental leave and the algorithm doesn't like it when you can't feed it content constantly. So to keep the lights on in here, I'd appreciate what support you can offer. I got one more of these videos and then I'm back in March. Stay cool, friends. Yeah, if you let the, if you let the mainstream media tell it, or the lamestream media as I call them, they're gonna tell you, you gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta be scared of every kaiju that comes stomping around in your city, you know? You can't live your life in fear. I think evacuation is a personal choice. I don't agree with evacuation mandates or evacuation passports.
It doesn't matter to me what analogy for COVID is rampaging through my city, you know? Nothing changes my values. Oh, Biclops is heading away from the city. Don't evacuate. Oh, Biclops is heading towards the city. Now you should evacuate. How am I supposed to follow this logic? And, 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 and here's another thing that they don't, they don't tell you. It's basically the same as being stepped on by an elephant, which happens all the time. You don't evacuate the city because there's, there's an elephant. I gotta, I gotta be honest, until 2020, I'd never heard the word evacuation. Suddenly that word's on everyone's lips, evacuation, evacuation. Where'd they get that, you think?